these two get along together, you know? I never met either one. Oh, I met Pablo. I didn't, didn't meet Scotty Elch. So I don't know, you know? That's a, I love that story. And what's cool is you, I put a picture of the Nellie T on that Facebook site. And I found that in my grandma's books. I don't know why she had that picture, but it's in there. It's, it's Florida, Francis, and it's there on the Nellie T. So it's pretty cool. And Nellie came on there, and she says, well, I don't know which one of us it's named after. She says, I'm the only true Nellie. But I wasn't even born when this picture was taken. or I was, Because or, she they got the boat from her grandfather. She said that her grandmother and her grandfather had different, I mean, grandmother and great-grandmother had different names, but they called them both Nellie. So figures it was named there after the nickname for her great-grandmother. So, or no, her grandmother. It was a cool story listening to her talk about it. Anyway, what else you got? Do you remember the time that uh, garbage truck backed into City Hall? I do remember that, and it was really cool that it happened. Well, the guy's name was that, never heard. Do a set up there so they could hear that. When the car, well, when the car ran into City Hall, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, well, it was a guy named Washkansky. I think that was his name. He, uh, he was. And, and City Hall at the time to set the okay, stage. Figured, okay, I'll, yeah. I'll put it in there. It was at the corner of uh, Oak Street and Church Street. Right. The building behind the community center. Yeah, behind the, the community center there. next to the old Catholic church. Yeah, it's yes. still there today inside that that, fence, that gray building. Well, uh, they had City Hall in there. Willa Dean Ryder was the mayor then. And this guy was the head of city maintenance, and he wanted to raise. And they told him no. So he drug, came down here, got a garbage truck, in the middle of a meeting, goes down there and backs into the building. It was just cinder block. And crushes this huge hole into the building. And, of course, they immediately moved City Hall out of there. But it was a windfall for all of us neighborhood kids because all of a sudden we had a vacant house to play in. And we played in there all the time. Had a big attic. Man, it was just perfect. And it stayed like that for a long time. And I'll tell you a little something that got me in trouble, but I'll tell you anyway. They had the uh, uh, fishing game dinner. The Lions Club always did it every year, right? And they would box in that outside patio where the museum sits now. It used to be a big shuffleboard court there. And they would box that in, and of course they'd all be out there drinking all night, and they had those big old canisters of Coke. And so the morning after it was all over, me and a couple of buddies, about four or five of us, we went all the way over there, we all grabbed us a big old canister of Coke, and we hauled it over to that little place we were going to drink this Coke, right? We don't realize it's just syrup. <laughs> we get over there, and we bust them things open, and we think, all right, man, look at this. I mean, you're looking at like, what, five gallons of Coke? And man, that stuff tasted so nasty. We couldn't wait to get it back over there so they could take it back. <laughs> yeah, we sneaked off with a little something there. Another thing we used to do that was bad as kids, but well, it wasn't bad, but one of us would always sneak into the, the game dinners, right? Always into the deep sea roundup sometimes too, because they always boxed that one in. It was kind of like sealed off on the dinner nights. And one of us would sneak in and we'd start walking around looking on the tables and these people would have their tickets. And it wasn't like a dinner ticket like they do nowadays. It was a thing that was a pass to get in. And we'd gather up enough for all of our friends. We'd put one on, we'd go out and hand it over the fence so our friends could come in. And we'd go in there, and we'd all go in there and eat. And I, I won't tell you her name, but when I was about, I guess, 15, Laurel Farley was selling the tickets at the drugstore. She asked me if I wanted to buy one, they like five bucks. And I said, yeah. So I was gonna buy one, I was gonna do it the right way this time. And I bought a ticket. And I went up there, and I went to the door. And this lady, who you all know, but I will not mention her name, told me, she jerked out of my hand and she says, you get out of here right now, you're not sneaking in with this ticket. Laura Farley was standing there. And then Laura grabbed it out of her hand and says, he will come in with that ticket. He paid for it. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. He bought it from me. Well, she was real embarrassed. You know that she did that. <laughs> I love Laura Farley. I worked with her for a long time at the drugstore. Talking about the pharmacy, are you talking about Lynn Gavitt's pharmacy? or Well, it was or, Fred Jones' pharmacy then. And, and was it in the same building? <clears throat> well, let me tell you where that started. My very first job, Mark, Mark, Mr. Jones, he owned the building on the corner of Red Ziegler has Caster's, with Caster's Collections in there now. And that was the Jones Pharmacy then, his first one when he got here. He had bought it from Roy Turnbow, who had had the Island Food Store there, but had built another one. So pharmacy, Jones Pharmacy moved in there about 59. And by the time I was like five or six years old, I would go down there with my mom all the time. I just lived three houses down. And Mr. Jones would hire me every month. He gave me one whole dollar bill to go up under that building because it was high, pick up all the trash that blew under there. And I'd put it in a big old garbage can and pull it all out. 
a dollar would buy me like 10 Cokes, man. It was a lot of big dollar. And uh, he hired me every month to come and do that. And I probably did that for a couple of years. And I remember one year I took some of the money that I'd made from him. I'd saved it up like 4 or $5, big money. And I went and bought a bunch of Kool-Aid. And I opened the Kool-Aid stand up on the opposite corner, down on Station Street on Roberts. And I made a lot of money selling Kool-Aid, man. People stopped buying buy my Kool-Aid for 10 cents a cup. At the end of the day, you know, I'd have a couple of dollars in my pocket. And then eventually I went to, I got my first real daily job was at the Porter Ranch Movie Theater. I worked for Miss Hamill. She paid me 50 cents a day and free movies to come out there and sweep up all the popcorn cups and bags and everything every day. During now, this, the summer, was, this was Mrs. Hamill. Port Theater. Her name was Mrs. Hamill. She owned that Port Theater with the resale, Carol's Okay, that was now. before Leo Barron's. Yeah, okay. that was before Leo. Leo and them bought that from her. Okay. Leo liked to tell the story that the day after they signed the paper to buy the theater, it blew away. It's one of his favorite stories. The, the, the ink wasn't dry and Celia came through. But anyway, Miss Hamill hired me, and I worked for her that summer. And at the end of the summer, of course, the job ended at the end of the summer because she closed. And she was a school teacher. Here. Yeah, she was a school teacher too, fifth grade, taught me in fifth grade. Ooh, boy, she slapped my hand with the rulers a she lot of times. Tough. No, she was tough. She's good. So she, uh, she had bought that movie theater with her husband who passed away here. But she ran it by herself in the end. So anyway, at the end of that uh, first summer I worked, I was in the fifth grade. Mr. Jones called me on the phone at the house and said, come down to talk to him. He had just built the place across the street. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to go to work for him over there, and I did. I, was, uh, I started there my fifth grade summer. So yeah, the summer, I had just got out of the fifth grade. No, I worked the fifth grade summer at the movie. The first, uh, my fifth grade, right as sixth grade was starting. I went to work for him, and I worked for him until the ninth grade, until I got almost out of the ninth grade. And I love to tell this story. My mama taught me how to work really, really hard and do a good job. But Fred Jones taught me how to make the money off of it. One day I'm in her checking in stock, and there was always a box of drugs, and then the rest of the stuff sitting there that we put on the shelf outside. And I marked it with a little grease pencil and stuff. And he walks back there, and he gets the invoice. He says, let me see that invoice. And he pulls it over. It's McKesson Robbins' invoice. And he, he always had this big old long cigarette holder, right? He kept his little cigarette in. And he pulls it out, and he's got a pencil, and he's looking down that list. And I'm standing right beside him. And he stops, and he says, okay, you see this? And he points, and there's a name of a drug, and it was $8. And he reaches over in the box. He digs around. He finds it. He says, now this is how you make money. And he took his pencil and wrote $64 on it. Walked straight out, sold it to Jan Keene. I told the name. Went out and sold it, and I says, Wow. Pretty good markup in pharmacy. <laughs> so after that, I would, and inevitably could tell you this, she was one of my best customers. My mama gave me a dollar for lunch in the morning. I would go over to the Island Cafe, Island Food Store, and I would buy, there was these little penny candies, I'd buy five cent five nickel baby roots and Butterfingers, and I'd those eight cent cinnamon rolls they used to sell there, and those nickel donuts. And I'd spend my whole dollar on that stuff. Go to the school, I'd have it in a beer box. I'd sit it on a bench, and I'd sell everything. The penny candies were a nickel. The nickel candies were a quarter. The donuts were a quarter. By lunchtime, I'd have about three bucks. And I'd go back over there, because nobody, everybody would hang out at the school and wait for baseball so they could touch up when the bell rang five minutes after we got out. I'd go buy a bunch more candy, come back. Oh, Netta was one of my best customers. Netta, you know you were. Um, boy, Netta, and she was, I say that because Netta's son tried to do it when he got up into school, and they wouldn't let him do it. And she told him, well, Lester <laughs> Willie did it. <laughs> That's a little bit earlier, though. But, um, yeah, and by the end of the day, I'd go home with 7 or $8 in my pocket. And my mama called Mr. Page one day and says, I had to put it in my top drawer. I had a bunch of cash in my top drawer. My mama called Mr. Page and says, hey, where's Lester getting all this money? He's not stealing it, is he? Mr. Page says, no, he's out there making a fortune on the playground. We're going to start charging 20% if he keeps it up. <laughs> well, maybe you were the first convenience store. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and what's funny, a walking convenience it's store. It's not 200 yards from the school. It's not like it, he was bringing something from a distance. No. Well, you know what it was, is we weren't allowed to touch up for baseball until the little guys went in for lunch. This is when we were in middle school at Brundrap. The little kids had to go in first, then we could touch up. So all my friends, well, everybody, would stand out there on the concrete slab waiting for the little kids to go. The second the little kids got in, they could run touch up the base. It was about five minutes break. They didn't want to take the time to go to the store and try to get back. Everybody wants to bat. 
right? Just work up. I was a good catcher. I knew I'd get out there and get right up, you know. It, it was. When did Gavitt's turn up, and when did, when did they buy the pharmacy there? Mr. Gavitt came, okay, when at the end of my ninth grade year, Brett Jones still owned it, and Mr. Gavitt was coming in. He was going to buy it, so that would have been 1971 or so. Uh, Bill Gavitt was in the eighth grade well, I'm I thinking grow. that we graduated out of the eighth, out of the eighth grade into high school in '71. You did. Yeah, I did. Right. And as I did that, I went into the ninth grade, and I worked there through the ninth grade, half of it at least. And um, Mr. Jones called me into his office one day, go back into the area where he makes the drugs up. He calls me back there, and he says, "Listen," he said, "I've sold the drugs for a new man coming in, and he's got a son who's going to do all the work for him." That was um, Bill. He said, "His son's going to do all what you've been doing." So he said, I've already arranged for you another job. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he had called Virginia Fisher at IGA Family Center. And he told me to go down there that night and talk to her, and I did. And she talked to me and told me what I'd be doing. So I went to work for him. And that was, uh, had to be right about around January or so. Because right after that, I'd been working there for maybe a month, a month and a half. I had an accident. I was playing basketball, and I, I got my cartilage broken, torn in my knee. And I had a cast on from my hip to my ankle. Jim McGee will tell you this story, too. It was on from my hip to my ankle. And there were two other stock boys there from uh, Ranges Pass. Now, in those days, we didn't have spring break. We had Easter, Easter weekend. Break. That was spring break on steroids here. Everybody <laughs> came at once. Those two stock boys in high school quit. I worked three straight days, 16 hours a day, in that cast. And I kept that store stock in going, okay? And, uh, well, that earned me some great respect down there, I'll tell you what. And, uh, and that was my first sojourn into the IGA. I worked there for about four years, I guess. I, I, I left there at the end of my senior year. And I went out and did the big stuff. That's about when I started. Where, at IGA? Yeah, 75. About 75, yeah. Yeah, it was when I went out to work for Brown. So, so Gavitt came here, not to keep going back to the pharmacy, but he came here after Celia. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, after so, Celia. So, okay. I'll tell you about Celia again, about the pharmacy. I was in the seventh grade when Celia hit. And Mr. Jones, the night before Celia hit, it wasn't supposed to hit, okay? It was supposed to go on into Galveston, Louisiana area. It was going to go by us. Also, wasn't nothing to it. No, it wasn't much of a storm. It was going to go by us. And the next morning, the sirens are going. Uh, you can hear hammers. It was real eerie outside. You could hear it. Mom woke us up. It was still dark. It was still dark. She said, you guys need to get up. we got to pack up and go. And about that time, the phone rang. 7495224 called me. That was the drugstore. They called me and uh, said, could you come down here and help us take the windows? It was Mr. Jones. And I said, okay. So I rushed down there to help him. And just those two big glass windows in the door to the front is all they had to take. And we put duct tape over them, taped them all up. And then, of course, we all left for the hurricane. Came back. I'll tell you something. I learned real good respect for duct tape. Those windows were perfectly in good shape when we got back. There was no roof on the building, but the windows were perfect. <laughs> the whole roof was gone. The whole roof. When you went upstairs into the house, it was a beautiful place up there. I guess it still is. You were outside. <laughs> we were just thinking wrong. I spent the first two weeks cleaning up. That part, I have a scar right here in the middle of my hand. You can see it. While I was cleaning up the top of the drugstore, a brown recluse bit me. My arms swelled up like pie pie. I still worked. Still did all my cleaning up. But boy, I was big. Mr. Jones gave me some kind of a, something to put on it. Finally got rid of it. But that was my brown recluse. Boy, my hand looked so bad. But yeah, those windows were perfect. The bottom was perfect. Just no roof. So, <laughs> you mean like open to the sky? or just Open to the sky, Mark. Look up at the cloud and the sun and everything's up there. And what was really funny was everything was still in the house. The beds were still made. They weren't torn up, you know, or thrown around or anything like that. Everything was still where it was. A lot of, just lot of mysteries after a storm. Huh? There's a lot of mysteries after a storm. I know. It, it just took the roof. I don't even know where the roof went. I don't remember hearing where it went. I had to go somewhere. It was a big roof. But it was totally gone. See, that was... That's one of the home movies that I can't find of ours. I got the Celia from a lot of town, but they went down Allison Street in video too, and I can't find that. I would love to find that one. And I'm still thinking it might have been in that box and we missed it. 
and we want to redo those eventually. And I'd love to find it. There's a couple that should be in there. Jackie was talking about the one where my daddy skidded me down the street and made it look like I was driving. I remember right. that, but I didn't see it when we did those. We still did like probably three hours of them. Got a, quite a bit of them. But I'm not sure that we got everything. We think we did. We weren't very organized. We were having too much fun talking and looking at them. So, and I wonder how much of that is still out there that needs to be done. I have Betty Richardson's home movies from 58. Um, that, I'm getting ready to put that one up. It's the 19, I think it's the 58 Deep Sea Roundup, but she drives around town. She goes down on the waterfront. She films a few of the people that are working down there. You see the Toot Toot two Club. Um, you see Mac and Shorty Fowler in it, Old Island people. Uh, there's some video of her coming down the causeway through the toll gates. You can see where you had to pay. I got to clip the picture of that one to put up. There's a toll gate there with the guy in there with his little toll gate hat on. And then it shows her going over that first bridge. It used to swing out. You probably went on those, didn't I did. you? Yeah, you know, those, those bridges that swing out. <coughs> what else two, was that? Huh? Two there was ones. two of them. Yeah. There was one main one on the main channel, and then there was a small one that didn't open as much as the other one did. The one on the intercoastal opened all the time. The other one was just every now and then at Red, what was that called? Red Ball Pass or something like that. I don't remember. Yeah, it's an Exxon cut. It's where that second bridge is now, though. But where that tall bridge is now is where that main one was. Right. It was always opening. But not I mean when it, well you know the one in Corpus used to do that too. When you went, it was they were doing it at Celia. When we ran from Celia, we went across that long causeway bridge going to Corpus from Portland. That didn't used to have the hump over it because their big boats would go back in there and storms. They opened it like this. It was a big lift bridge. Then they put it down. And I remember being stopped on that bridge. My mama was mad. <laughs> There's a hurricane. You could just lose those boats. She wanted to get her family into Corpus. <laughs> Tell you. Celia was kind of interesting for us. My aunt has five kids, her and my uncle. They come down from Port Aransas, I'm Port Aransas, Port Arthur every summer and spend a week with us back then, right? That year, he couldn't stay. He had to go back, hit some, he worked for Gulf Wall and they had some book work they had to do. So he brought them down here and dropped them off, stayed one night and went home. He was going to come back and pick them up the next week. Okay, he went back to Port Arthur. There's my mama, five of us, my aunt and five of them kids okay so six and six then my great-grandmother and my grandmother and one Ford Fairlight and my mama took half to Aransas come back got the other half to Aransas half to Gregory come back got half took to Gregory took the from Gregory went into Corpus we stayed at a place called the um, Safari Inn on Leopard still there and in fact most Port Aransas people all were staying out there I ran into Woody Owsley's family was out there by the Turnbulls were out there the uh, Turnbulls actually stayed in the same one we were in. And um, during the middle of Celia, we had all, it, these places had these huge glass windows. So what we did was, like, went to the mattresses. We took all the beds and put them up against those glass windows. And then we all sat up against them to keep them there in case the windows blew out. And the storm is going on outside. And the kids, of course, were peeking through the cracks, man. And you see all kind of stuff. And there was a Colonel Sanders fried chicken place across the street that I watched come to pieces one piece at a time. Zip, 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 zip. And when it was done, there was nothing but a concrete wall left. There was a trailer house back in the neighborhood behind us. We were watching it, and it, it was rocking. We were watching it rock. And finally, it just went blam, and it fell over on its side. A couple of seconds later, the door flew open on the top, and this man jumped out. And he starts reaching in, and he grabs out this other man, and this man jumps off. Okay, this is pretty high up, eight feet or so, you know, ten feet. And then the guy starts reaching, he pulls out some kids, and he's handing kids down. And he's, they're pointing to the neighborhoods, and the kids are running into the neighborhoods. And about ten of them came out of that thing, and they all disappeared. By the end of the store, there's nothing left of it. It was gone. And me and Frankie Martin, I ran into him, he was staying out there too. We walked downtown to Corpus. We were... All that on Leopard, those car lots, I mean, it did look like an atom bomb went off. And we got downtown, and uh, the National Guard was standing there. And these were very serious men with guns. And we're kids, we're seventh graders. And the gun came up. You boys need to turn around and go right back where you came from. Yes, sir. Well, we turned around and went right back where we came from. Then we get to Port Aransas, excuse me, we get to Port Aransas, and there's National Guard all over the place. You can see it in that yes. Celia film of mine, the one truck goes by. They were all over the place. Which is good. <clears throat> Got to have somebody to keep law and order going because it's kind of crazy after that stuff. 
But, Which way uh, did you come back? Huh? Which way did you come back to the island? We came back around. We came from the Port Ranchers. I mean, that Ranchers Passway. Was the ferry working? You know, I can't tell you. You know, when when we got here, Carla came by boat. I know. When we got here after after see you, we went to Sinton. And, uh, you know, we had the station wagon with L&M Motel all over Port Aransas, Texas, phone number. You always have that. And and we're coming back, and, and right by the seawall, the uh, National Guard guy's there, and he stops us and says, well, you can't go without some sort of paperwork. And my dad says, well, you see the writing on the door. I mean, we're Port Aransas residents. And they said, I'm sorry, you can't let you, you, can't let you through. And he said, well, do you have bullets in that gun? And he said, "Yes, sir, I do." And he said, "Well, you better you better use them because we're going." And we just took off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we got to the uh, ferry, and there's cars parked there, and there's no ferry back yet. And here's Butch Alfie. That's Alf right, Butch Alfie with, with, with Lady Lorraine. There were no ferries yet. Butch Alfie with the Lady Lorraine, picking us up, taking us over, and we all had to walk back, and we made the ungodly walk of shame back. You come down the Alister Street, <coughs> and you come down Calder Street. And just mayhem everywhere, and then you see that big Kaufman building out in the middle of Cotter, right. and right there by Alist Alistair, you see that big building, which is now the South Jetty. This is South Jetty building. It was over there in uh, across from Ellis's next property. Across, yeah, on oh, Ellis's yeah. property, across from the Tarpon Inn. The what? Yeah, way across. Yeah. Yeah, but actually, it was on the other side of the pizzeria place. Yeah, but it's the CPL yeah. building. Yeah, yeah. The CPL building. Yeah. And somehow or another, it went around that building. And <laughs> And was dead in the middle. You couldn't hardly open the doors well, to the sandpiper, yeah. which was the sandpiper. Imagine the water, though. You've seen Gilbert's pictures that his dad took. Yes. And so there was a lot of water moving around. And water is the biggest destruction, destructive thing in a storm. Oh, absolutely. The mood. Woody, Woody Owley had a false floor in his bathroom at Woody's. And every time a storm would come, he would go in there and get one of his guys, and they would pull the whole floor, lift it straight out. And they went around and put it in the building, inside the building. And that left nothing but ground down there. So when that water came up, instead of lifting the building, because it can't get in fast enough, it just filled right up. And it made it. It made it right through Celia. I mean, it was one of the only places on the waterfront besides Matthews that went through Celia and didn't go. Still there. Right. Everything else was just creamed. Well, there wasn't that much left, because Carla had wiped out the waterfront pretty much. While we're talking about it, you're saying that Matthews was there after Celia. Oh, yeah. When did the, when did that come down? You know, I heard that was the biggest job Corps of Engineers ever had to do was tearing that building down because it was so solid. Okay. When it came down, it's been a long time. I really didn't think it was there during Celia. <coughs> huh? I, I didn't realize it was there during Celia. It was there in Celia. It was there, so was Woody's. Well, no, Woody's. Was there for a long time. Yeah, look at those uh, pictures from 69 or so of the waterfront. You don't see anything where Fisherman's Wharf in them are. But Matthews is there. You know, Matthews was torn down. And it was later, though. It was way into the 70s when they tore Matthews down. You wouldn't ask the question. I'm well, I got the 72 aerial. We'll look at it and see. Yeah, we'll see if it's there. But I can't tell you when they tore it down. It lasted a long time. When they tore it down, they left the fish house. And there was nothing there for a while. And then uh, Rick Corn in Virginia built a little place where they, now it's Virginia's on the bay. There was just a little small bait stand in there that they had. And then uh, the other place over there, Glenn Martin ran it. He called it uh, um, Woody Sports Center. Okay. That was before he actually bought Woody's. And then they got rid of all that and built Woody's. But So what core engineers have to do with it? They had something to do with tearing it down because they wanted to open that space back up down there or something. I can't remember. Because it was actually not, it was kind of like built yeah, on it was like public water. Squatter. Yeah, it was squatted in there. You know? It's not, because when they put that in, there was no water, there was nothing but water where the road right. is now. Well, the because it was all water, tapered. It was all flats. water. The boats couldn't get close enough to the land, so they no. built a building out there. They had to build it out there just like they did those old piers when they built them out right. there. The boats couldn't get in because they didn't have dredges. And then Teddy now got the dredge and started dredging all that out so the boats could get in better. And uh, there's some good pictures of that in the archives, of them dredging that out. The ones where they're standing up, where now you have put boats, they're just standing there. That dredge must have been a pretty shallow dredge to get that done. Yeah, I had to have very little draft. Yeah, very little draft to get in there and do that. And that dredge, 
When I was a kid, that dredge sat right there across the street where that, what the heck that trailer park's called? I could never remember the name of it. Bonner's Trailer Park. Bonner's Trailer Park. It sat right there where Arturo Maldonado and them had their trailer down in them. And it, we used to play on it as kids. By then it was all rusty. And we'd go over there and play on it. And we'd go up there and act like we were big boat captains. It wasn't like a boat like this or nothing, but it was a boat, you know. And we'd play in there all the time. I bet you remember playing in the big pit over here full of telephone wire. Oh, let me tell you what, that got us in trouble. When that big concrete building, well, they used to be the ice plant was there. And he had a, it was really high up. And of course, underneath had been filled with sand when they put the concrete in there. But over the years, that sand had washed out and everything else. And one day after school, we were about in the fourth or fifth grade, I'd say fourth. We were over here playing around the neighborhoods. In fact, we might have been going to play on that boat. And I saw underneath that building, that little little hole, not much, just about that big, you know, where the bending underneath, there were several places under there. And I poked my head in there and I looked, and it was like caves back in there. And I thought, wow, how cool. Because there's sand, but you go around like this, around through there like that. So I climbed in, and my friends were going, hey man, what's in there? I said, man, it's like a cave in here. So we all climbed in there, and it was real dark, though. We go a little ways, and we kind of got scared. So we all sneaked back out, Jimmy Roach was there. Jim Caldwell was there, I was there. There's several of us. So we ran down to Jimmy Roach's house and we stole some of his mama's candles, okay? Ran back down there and went up underneath and we were lighting candles and walking, going under there. And there was one nice big round area in there and we stuck candles in the wall and that was our, like a little secret place, right, to be. Nobody could find us there. And we did that for a, a while, maybe a month or so. Miss Fortson found out about it. Somebody told her they saw us going under that building. So they came over here and they watched us. And they saw us go in. The next day at school, they called us in the office. Now, this has nothing to do with school. But she was the school warden. Miss Fortson was the school warden. Then. In those days, it did. They called us into the office and said, Hey, uh, we understand you guys have been going under the OIS house. Yeah? You know, that's really dangerous under there. And it was right. If that would have caved in, it would have killed us all. Right? And uh, we didn't think so at the time. You live forever. And I remember, boy, we got our butts whipped. Each of us, like five legs, man. So we'd never go back under there. And we didn't, <laughs> we didn't want no more of that stuff. <laughs> but yeah, that was the coolest little hideout in the world. You're right in the middle of everything. And nobody knew where you were. But then after they tore it down, they had this big concrete pit you had to jump in. And it had all the old scrap telephone wire in it. That's right. He did throw all that scrap telephone wire in there, didn't he? I mean, of course, copper, I guess, wasn't worth anything. Not really, not I mean, it was just miles. Yeah. Telephone wires. Yeah, that's right. They did tear that down. They they just tore the floor out of it or something, didn't they? Yeah. They just left it hollow. Right. You had to climb up over it. It's like a big old concrete square tower. Well, I remember hanging out there when I was a kid. We'd hang out at the ice. The ice house was one of the places you went, you know. Pete had ice and there was beer there and the guys would sit around and drink beer all day. And Edward Nelson worked there. His dad worked there then. one arm Pete. Yeah, one arm Pete. And, uh, you know, his daughter's friend of mine on Facebook. It's pretty cool. Yeah, she ran into me. She said she was, she, I, how was her, I can't remember her last name now. Pete had one arm, but it was about this, this big around. Yeah, you got an old man could handle huge blocks of ice with one arm. And he could really handle that ice. ice no, this is the one that Joe Bomarito bought. Let, no. Or, no, uh, that's a different, different Yeah, one. he built another one back over here. Okay. After that one kind of went down, he built he another over one here. on the old Munzel slab. It was built on the end of that slab. Bomberito bought that from him. <laughs> Excuse me. So originally, it's, it was. Yeah, I hope that somebody took pictures of those slabs before they bulldozed. Did they already bulldoze this side? There. Huh? They're still there. No, they bulldozed one on the other side. The right. Slab. Right. But this side, there's still. Well, there. She really should get pictures of that. I hope there's an aerial of that somewhere where you can see it because, you know, this was going to be town to Munzel. He was going to bring it up here on the high ground, so he didn't have to worry about all that stuff down there. I mean, God. There's some pictures, I think it's um, the Murkovich pictures, where they're hanging out at these places. Right. You never see inside any of them, but you can see how many of them there are and what, what industry was going on over here in those days. This was going to be the hub over here for Munzel. Everybody had their little place where they wanted to put their hub. Now, Ropes, you know, he really didn't care much about Port Aranda's. He just wanted to get the pass going. And then Port Aranda's may have, but he really was trying to push it into Corpus. Yeah, he had a hotel corpus. over there. And he wanted to open up the pass down there. Think how nice that would have been. Except for if you had to go to Corpus and cross the ferry that way, you'd have hated it. Now, I found a bunch of stuff in old newspapers I turned over to Mark about ropes and what he was doing. Yeah. 
But uh, yeah, you say high ground. This has got to be at least six and a half foot high. But to them, that was high ground, and it's no waves going to be washing in here like it would be on that end of town down there. Except for Carla. Well, do. you know, Port Aransas is a strange place. We've never had a real downtown. You know, like Aransas has a downtown. All the.